Brian Chef. Thank you. I'm gonna take one. Thanks. Any questions? Show of hands, who's here? <laughs> I know it's the morning, Saturday morning at Oshkosh. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, without bragging about myself, I'm gonna just jump right into this and, and talk about uh, I got one. I, I went. Well, I didn't know that. Now I have two. No, I don't need two. I might need two. <laughs> um, any event, so why do we study accidents? Has anybody read this book? I mean, if you have not read this book, read this book. I've read it like three times already, and every time I read it, I get more out of it. And I don't believe in death by PowerPoint, but I'm going to put one slide up from one of my favorite sentences, I'm sorry, paragraphs in this book. So you can read along or you can just listen, because I'm going to read it. An airplane crashes, and there is a most thorough investigation. Experts analyze every particle, every torn remnant of the machine and what is left of those within it. Every pertinent device of science is employed in reconstructing the incident and searching for the cause. Sometimes the investigation, investigators wait for weeks, sometimes a year, until the weather is exactly the same as it was during the crash. They fly exactly the same route in exactly the same kind of airplane. And they go to elaborate, they go to elaborate trouble trying to duplicate the thinking of that pilot who can no longer communicate his thinking. Often at a considerable risk to themselves, the investigators attempt what have been reported as the final tragic maneuvers of the crashed airplane. And sometimes they discover a truth which they can explain in the hard, clear terms of mechanical science. They must never, regardless of their discoveries, write off a crash as simply a case of bad luck. They must never, for fear of political or official ridicule, admit other than to themselves, which they all do, that some totally unrecognizable genie has once again unbuttoned his pants and urinated on the pillar of science. While that last line is funny and strong, it basically is saying that sometimes we make a really thorough look at accidents and can only conclude that stuff happens. And Bob Hoover said it best when he said sometimes that happens and if you're not ready for it and you're not prepared for it, you're dead. Next. So today I'm just going to tell you why we study accidents, how to study accidents, and then maybe if we have time we'll review a couple accidents. But I'm not going to uh, review accident. We're not going to get into great detail. I'm not going to look at one and analyze it. I've done hundreds of these. I do a lot of uh, expert witness consulting, looking into investigating an accident and rendering an opinion as to what I think happened uh, in litigation that results from accidents. So. While humbling and somber, sometimes I learn a lot. I think I've become better for it, for looking at what happened. I'm like, wow, that could have happened to me. Um, one day I had a friend come to my door, hadn't seen him in a while, and he had a medicine bag attached to his belt that automatically delivered chemotherapy medicine to him. And so he told me he had uh, colon cancer, was surviving it and battling it with this medicine and off work. And, the first question out of my mind was, how did you know you had it? <laughs> and why did I ask that? You know, yeah, how you doing and all that, but I wanted to know how he knew. What was the first sign? Why did I want to know that? Because I don't want it to happen to me. And I want to be able to prevent it if, it if it should come knocking on my door. So what did you see? What were the signs? Turns out he told me some symptoms that I was actually having. And so I told my doctor about these symptoms. He said, yeah, we ought to do a colonoscopy. And so we did, and we found polyps, and they were precancerous. They took them out, no big deal, nothing. Cut it early. But had I waited until the requisite age to start getting colonoscopies, I was like 42 years old at the time. That was like two years ago. <laughs> then it might have been too late. So I learned from the mistakes or from the encounters of others, not necessarily the mistakes, but the things that happened and the unfortunate things that happened to other people. We want to learn what happened to other people so that we can better ourselves or prevent it from happening to ourselves. Um, as far as looking at accidents, if I were to tell you there was a Bonanza that lost its engine and made a turn back to the airport and crashed shy of the, the runway. And this has happened. We'd all be critical. 
right off the bat. We'd assume some things. We'd think, wow, you shouldn't be turning back, you should go straight. This happened out in an area where there's just nothing but flat land. Why would you turn back and go to the airport? And, you, and you'd be judge, judgmental about it. And let's say afterwards I said, okay, well, he was at 3,000 feet when he turned back. Does that change things a little bit? You might think, when I first said it, you might have been thinking, oh, it was right after takeoff and he was down low. He was at 3,000 feet. Okay, maybe a, a turn back. So maybe we don't call it a turn back. We call it turning around and flying back to the airport. But what if I told you he was level at 3,000 feet for about 15 miles? Tried to make it back to the airport and crashed shy of the airport in a big old field. So the more you learn about the details, the more you're going to cast a different judgment on an accident, what happened, and what you can glean from it. Why is this not working? There we go. So I'm going to forgive me for doing a little bit of reading because I can't repeat it better than I wrote it myself, but an accident is constantly knocking on our door of every flight. It's always lurking after us, and we're incessantly bombarded by threats, some big, some small, some obvious and some insidious, and we're constantly beating them down like we're playing a game of whack-a-mole. Most of the time, even during our day-to-day -day existence, we do this without even realizing it. For example, if you're walking along a road or a sidewalk and you see a lip like this, you subliminally notice this hazard. It's a hazard, right? This, this lip in the sidewalk. You'll notice I stopped walking and took a picture and the dog is looking at me like, hey, come on, let's go. We don't split the pack. <laughs> and uh, so an experienced human will subliminally see it and mitigate the threat by lifting their foot maybe just a little bit higher. Inexperienced humans young children or somebody texting while they're walking, might trip over it. So benign threats like this are constantly coming at us. When flying an airplane, experienced pilots pay attention and maintain, sit maintain situational awareness, keeping these threats benign. Flying a final approach course is not as simple as pointing the airplane at the runway and letting go, like you're throwing a dart at a, a bullseye at a, a target. So flying is a constant series of control inputs and corrections. The corrections made by brand new pilots and new drivers of cars are extreme and noticeable and sometimes divergent. The flight control inputs made by an experienced pilot are often imperceivable and sometimes they make it look like they're doing nothing. In fact, they're constantly making a series of small corrections. So shooing away hazards is a talent that is refined with experience. Experienced pilots make flying look easy. But no matter how imperceivably pilots who are of experience are playing a game of whack-a-mole with the hazards coming at them. If fighting off these hazards seems like a lot of work to you, then you're probably missing the mole. <laughs> you might even be creating hazards of your own. Come on, you, you can do it. We fear the threats that are not apparent, the ones to which other pilots have fallen prey. That is why we study accidents, the ones of other pilots, so that we may learn to recognize the threat or the mole when it comes knocking on our own flight's door. So, how to study accidents. And I'm not going to, like I said, we're not going to get into researching a certain accident. I do have a couple if we get to the end and have some extra time. But it's more of a, I'm going to, you know, give a man to fish. He, you know, he can eat one meal, teach a man to fish, he can eat for a lifetime. So, in this case, I'd like to teach you to look at all accidents. So, the best thing to do, first of all, you get, and I'm going to credit my good friend Mark with this expression, the, an accident happens and we hear all kinds of things from the internet rapid response teams, right? The YouTube rapid response teams. That's what he calls them and that's kind of the, the case. You get these all kinds of stories. Some of them are good. Some of them give you the facts. I think we should use caution for anybody pointing fingers before you get the whole story. Because quite often, we'll get a story, we'll get blame, and then we'll learn more later and we go, that wasn't the case. But you've already defamed the poor deceased or whatever and, and mis misanalyzed the problem. So the first place to go is the NTSB docket. Has anybody looked at an NTSB docket before? Has anybody not heard of an NTSB docket? Everybody's heard of it? 
So that's where all the files are put. It's a document or labeling system, uh, listing the contents of a package or whatever. But in the NTSB docket is a place where they put all the evidence, all the reports, all the witness statements, the ATC information, the accident report, the factual report. Everything is in there. And I just want to show you an example of one on the NTSB website. Uh, if you want to take a scan of this, you'll see it. I'm going to go ahead and go to it in a second. And then I'll show this again in a second. But I'm hoping we can do internet here. <laughs> Looks like it's working. And if you've not been to it, oh, I'll put it back up. So this is the NTSB accident database and synopsis. You can go here with that link that I provided or just search NTSB docket search. It should take you here as well. But you've got accident start date and an end date if you just know a range you can put a whole month you put the aircraft category the category amateur make model registration when it happened where it happened uh, you can put all of this in there if you happen to have the accident number the oftentimes you'll see that in other articles or other websites if you see it you can put it right in here and go search and so that's just the search page which is very handy even airport code you can search by weather conditions you know show me all the accidents that happened when it was you know, IFR or below three miles visibility, so on and so forth. Or by phase of flight. All the accidents that happen taxiing or during takeoff, you can do that as well. And if you don't know a specific accident, you can just go look at, generically search for accidents that happen like that. There's the link. I'll just leave it up for a second. So in that, once you find it, you'll see a search result, you'll see a list of accidents. And I'm going to show you that. I'm going to have another link to an actual docket that we can take a look at. So how to study accidents, we'll look at a specific accident if you wanted to. Again, you can look up uh, also another place you can look. I'm going to get back to that. But first of all, there's the Aviation Safety Network. Anybody seen that? You see a link to that in a lot of places. There's a link to that. You can just scan this and open up different uh, pages in your browser if you want. Look at them later. The Aviation Safety Network, just to show you what that looks like, is right here. And you'll see all kinds of accidents you can go back you can look at the full database and you can search you're generally going to see airliner big accidents and until you go to the what they call the wiki base the wiki base is a smaller aircraft you can search for all accidents by type you can look by date it's a great database and for example if i just choose the top one here airbus 321 delta at denver well, i hate to see a 321 because i fly that airplane but you can click on it give you all kinds of information about the accident or incidents luckily no fatalities here um, where it happened, a narrative. This comes from the docket. Uh, but there's classifications and just all kinds of information in there. Then you might see some comments in there. Uh, use caution to the comments because you just never know the source. Consider the source when you read comments or, or on uh, forums that people are talking about an accident. If someone gives some credibility like, hey, I flew that airplane for 100 hours or so and gives you some kind of credibility, just make sure that Whenever somebody says something that you're going to rely on, that you're, you're getting credibility for that beforehand. Another great place to study accidents is the AOPA uh, Air Safety Foundation publishes these uh, accident case studies. And on this one, if you take a look at that, <coughs> if you, whoops, let me get back to it. And again, I'll put the link back up again. And I'll be happy to do these or put them up anytime after the presentation if you want to come back to them. But if we click on this one, you're just going to get all kinds of accident case studies here. And as an example, uh, if you just click it, you're going to get a video. And it's great to watch. It's going to show you all kinds of lessons. And he is meticulous in updating it after each uh -oh. flight. However, both of these methods require <laughs> get, manual it. inputs from the pilot. Neither can assess the actual fuel quantity in the airplane. NTSB investigators believe the pilot's actual fuel level was below his expected level for eight days. So this is just to show you the format of it, how well it's done, how well it's presented. They go into great detail. 
uh, if it's and generally they don't do it too early. What I consider is too early. Yeah. I believe the accident safety network is available, or the I'm sorry, the aviation safety network is available to everybody. Yeah, and you can also look on YouTube for them and just search for AOPA uh, Safety Foundation accident case studies. Uh, it's worth worthy of sharing to everybody. Forgive me if I'm wrong about that, but I believe it's available to everybody. Yeah, and we'll take a look at a section of one in just a little bit. But I just want you to see that's another great resource, other than the YouTube rapid response teams. So the other thing you want to really watch out for when studying accidents is eyewitness reports. Consider the source. Uh, if they're a pilot, you might give them a little bit more credibility. Anybody in here not a pilot? Okay, don't listen. <laughs> Non-pilots non will sometimes say things that just don't fit in the, the narrative. They might think that an airplane was spinning or they might s say things that they're using terminology incorrectly. I've seen a lot of witness reports that that, that use terms that aren't quite right. And uh, then you find out and see, actually see a video later and go, it wasn't spinning, it was actually doing this. You know, it was rocking back and forth or whatever. They'll say, oh, it stalled. And you don't know if they're talking about the engine or the wing, so, and so on and so forth. I worked an accident case that actually had quite a bit of uh, controversy. I shouldn't say controversy, difference between what was being reported, what's in the docket, I encourage you highly to read the docket yourself and form your own opinions because even in the court of law when we're testifying about accidents, we are not allowed to use the NTSB's uh, probable cause. It's only an opinion. When they come up with a probable cause, and it may not be valid, you may have a different opinion than they do. And I encourage you to do so, to have your own opinion. Look at all the facts. And this was a, an accident where this King Air actually, does anybody remember this? It lost an engine right after takeoff in Wichita and hit the flight safety building. <laughs> what? It hit the flight safety building, ironic. Three people in the simulator building were died, died. Two of them were in the simulator. What are the odds of getting killed in a mid-air collision while you're flying a simulator? <laughs> That's a bad day. It did happen, very sad. I, I don't mean to poke fun at it and have fun with it, but it's, a, it's horrible. But all of the reports, the things that you hear, uh, I think there's a YouTube video. I just want to show you. Here's one of them, for example, with the ad. Hey, what's been going on? Kind of a bad week for aviation. Uh, King Air 200 was taken off out of Wichita, Kansas, lost a left engine, and went into the Flight Safety International facility. Said lost a left the Merged Galactic lost spaceship two in a crash. It killed one of the pilots. The other one survived. The thing out in Wichita with the King Air 200, I used to fly a King Air 200, so I know a little bit about that. Uh, that airplane maxes out at 12,500 pounds, and it'll carry 540 gallons of uh, Jet A. And flew it for years. It's a great airplane. Uh, apparently, this one lost the left engine and was only in the air for about 30 seconds. And so in the first minute, a couple times, he said, lost the left engine, lost the left engine. Uh, and, and that was what was in the NTSB probable cause findings as well. Uh, on the, uh, where's my mouse? The internet rapid response teams were on it pretty quickly. Uh, the first post on Beach Talk was at uh, 8.34 a.m., minutes after the accident. Next post at 9.03, quoted from a news article that came out. The post said, declared an emergency after losing the left engine. First post with any substance was at 9.45. One could hope they already had it under control if they were calling the tower. To, they did. They called the tower while the aircraft was rolling. He's declaring an emergency. Uh, talking, not flying. So, right, aviate, navigate, communicate falls pretty low on the priorities. As it turns out, this pilot was a controller. And talking on the radio was his job. And he jumped all over it. Uh, so we know if he was talking on the radio, he had one hand on the yoke and there's a push to talk right there. It happened right when the gear was coming up. 952, it's impossible to know, but maybe the NTS, although I think the threatening didn't work, so it didn't feather, the engine didn't feather, the prop didn't feather. And finally, without a feather, rudder or boost, should be a non-event, they were activated, functioning properly, Appropriate flap setting, blah, blah, blah. Hopefully investigation will reach a satisfactory and determine the facts. That's true, they do. 1220 and all these, we just don't know what else the pilot was dealing with. And that's a good point. We don't know. We weren't there. So whenever you're looking at an accident, try to keep yourself from being critical of the pilot, of what was happening. You just don't know what was happening there. 
I mean, you never know if there's a medical condition or if there are passengers on board, if they were having an issue. I mean, you just don't know. Be very open-minded when you're studying an accident. Um, going back to the, the Kinger case, um, the NTSB final report, you can go look at that. Oh, this is, oh, that, those links are right. That's Catherine's report. Has anybody seen Catherine's report? Another great place to read about it. Generally just factual information until you get down to the forum uh, and you read that. So just be very skeptical of what you read in there. It's people talking about it. Often great discussion, uh, but just be very, very careful about what you read in there. One of the things that, so here I'm testifying about this accident and uh, we had so many engineers, this aircraft had just been worked on, going around the room talking about what part they worked on, how it could have failed to cause what happened, that they think it didn't fail. Love that shirt, more right rudder, man, it's just, I need that. <laughs> now, that's my password for everything. Oh, shit. <laughs> so everybody's going around the table, big, long table of lawyers and experts talking about what they think caused this engine failure. And they finally got around to me, the pilot expert, and asked me, what do you think happened? And I said, well, I've studied this entire accident. And, I, and I've looked at the facts. I've looked at the, uh, the report, the document. I learned that the, the uh, engine theoretically failed shortly after takeoff when the gear was coming up. I learned that the auto feather didn't work, which should work, the, where it feathers the engine automatically feathers the propeller automatically and it didn't feather. I read further on and it said somewhere in there that the engine, because of strike marks on the propeller, was determined to be at idle power at the time of the collision. And all these things just don't add up to me. It adds up to one thing because I've flown a King Air uh, and I've had this happen that when, <laughs> yeah, he knows, that the throttle migrated after when the pilot let go of the throttle to go get the gear handle. There are two friction locks, one for each power. I'm going to say throttle. Please know I'm using that interchangeably with power lever. So when the pilot reached for the gear handle, his hands were off the throttles or gear power levers, and one of them didn't have a tight friction lock and slides back. There's actually a great video that I, and so anyway, when they asked me about this in the, in the interview, everybody's thinking engine failure, the lawyers are now thinking cha-ching, 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 we're just, now we're all off the hook. We're trying to defend ourselves for this broken airplane. My opinion was there's nothing wrong with the airplane. Nothing failed. Everything was working properly. It's just that when the pilot took his hands off the throttles and put the gear up, <clears throat> one of them migrated backwards. That disables the auto feather because the throttle needs to be up to arm the auto feather. All the safety precautions get kicked off when the th throttle is back. It was a handful of airplane. The pilot was inexperienced. He was a career co-pilot. So the rejected takeoff, the, the throttle handling on takeoff was a, a very new thing or a, he was of limited experience in that. And so I said it just, migrated backwards and that led to this whole thing. All he had to do was reach over and push it back up and this thing doesn't happen. But he probably grabbed the wheel with two hands and I've had it happen to me. And when that's happening, it's like I was like, go for the gear, go for the throttle, what am I gonna do? Oh, throttle, shove it up, get it back up there. And it's a very disconcerting thing that how do you get the thing tightened again? So I also asked to see the, the maintenance card on the work that was done. The maintenance card actually says, Loosen friction lock. I don't know anything about maintenance. I'm not a mechanic, but I looked through the steps that had to be done to perform the work that was done. And one of them is loosen friction lock all the way. That's so that they can get to the spring. There's a spring that actually pulls that throttle back. I'm just going to show you this video. Power migration of a King Air throttle. Forget the ad. Here we go. Replay it. See him when he loosened the friction lock? One more time. He's loosening the friction lock down here. There's one for each power lever. There's a spring in there to pull it back. I don't know the mechanical reason for that. I know that it exists. I know it's there. And I just looked at all the facts here and I'm like, that's what happened to him. I've had it happen to me. It makes the most sense. There's another... Uh, uh, Occam's razor, anybody hear that? Yeah, the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. This is very simple, it's obvious, it makes sense. And they were going around the room with all these elaborate 
engineer type explanations of what could have gone wrong and denying the failure of their part. And we were so relieved to hear when I said, there's nothing wrong with this airplane. But did anybody hear about that in the King Air failure? Or are you still hearing today that as a King Air lost its engine? It didn't lose its engine. <laughs> so be wary of, of the things that you read and the things that you see, uh, even in the docket. Form your own opinions and educate yourself. So I implore anybody who's flying a King Air now, make sure you check the friction locks and do one at a time. Gosh, so that pilot and other pilots I've seen in a King Air will check both power levers at once and it feels tight. But the left one wasn't. It was totally loose. I also measured the threads on the, those little friction locks in the accident wreckage. I was able to go back and look at it and you could see the different position of the threads. It was all the way out. And you can tell because this aircraft burned up, sadly. And you can see by the burn marks where the, the, the throttle was set. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> there's a lot to look at on that. And so just be, like I said, yeah, be careful what you hear. Let's see. Get back through these. So reviewing a couple accidents, the, my, as my expert witness work progressed. I got baptized by fire. The first accident that I, I got to look at, analyze, and testify in court during the uh, uh, litigation was the Colgan 3407. Anybody here not hear of this accident? Very landmark case that many... So Colgan 3407 was in 2009. Uh, it just it was a, air, a commuter aircraft that stalled on final. Stalled and spun and killed everybody on board. Sadly, it killed one person on the ground as well because it hit a house. Horrible, horrible accident. Both sides of the litigation agreed that the pilot screwed up in this case. There's no question the pilot messed up when installed and spun the aircraft. So the litigation became how, how do you have a pilot, how does this airline have a pilot that's capable of such a heinous mistake? So the lawsuit was that the uh, negligence was hiring someone who had failed every check ride, someone who could not proceed anyway. This time he descends 100 feet below minimums, but the end result is the same. Silver, I gotta go around again at 75 Sierra. Silver, 75 Sierra, we're gonna contact one mile south of first time airport, three approach pressing. Let's try that again, please. Now, however, there's a new concern. Fuel. It's 6.26 p.m., four hours and 55 minutes into the flight. An I'm arrow. pretty low. How about two? Would that be okay? Summer 7 Sierra, climbing to 2,000. Climbing 1,700, turn left to Boise. Summer 7 Sierra, why is this going to be an alternate airport demand? Well, do you have anything that's easier than this? Summer Sunset Sierra, you can try to do the number six. Well, and uh, is the uh, weather better there? Summer Sunset Sierra, that's the high weather, which is currently 10 miles visibility, still 500 feet overcast, a little bit better than Georgetown. All right, uh, 3 3 November, thank you. As the aircraft nears Dover Air Force Base, en route to 3 3 November, the pilot asks a logical question. Ma'am, I don't suppose there's any chance I can uh, land at Dover. Some are 75 feet away, negative sun. It's, it's an emergency. There's no way we can have you land here. Okay. That's the yeah. But it is an emergency. Ten minutes later, and eight miles north of the base, there's a frantic call from the pilot of 75 Sierra. Ma'am, I'm declaring an emergency here. I'm out of fuel. I am out of fuel and going down. So the aim tells us, and I, I'll bring a little bit of lesson into it because I can't help myself, that we are supposed to declare an emergency when things become serious and before they become dire. He's looking at an airport, asks if he can land there. She says, no, not unless it's an emergency. He's in a Piper Arrow and he's been up in the air for five and a half hours, shot three approaches to a miss. And, and you can clearly hear in his voice he's stressed. As we sit here in this tent, it's easy to say, that's an emergency, I need to declare it, and I need to look at that runway and put my airplane on it right now. 
That's what should have happened. Uh, I don't know that we could all say that we would have actually done that. I'd like to think that we would, but as we sit here now, can we promise ourselves that if we're starting to get nervous, such to the point that we're talking like that on the radio, and you see a piece of pavement, take it, declare the emergency. I bet right now, if he had the opportunity to, he crashed, he turned around and crashed about two miles shy of Dover, Delaware, and died. Uh, so if he'd have landed on it at the time, I think that would have been, he would take that choice right now if he had that option. Uh, so declaring an emergency before it becomes dire. You need something, I need it now. You say, no, you can't land on that? Yes, I'm gonna land on that. Be assertive, so. <clears throat> on that low fuel exhaustion, there's an NTSB report, an NTSB docket that can be looked at as well. Here's another example, I think I had a link to it before, but that's a Catherine's report for this accident, which actually has links within it to the accident docket a link to the final report. You can look at that and study it. Uh, it's a great way. These, these three are my favorite. They're my go-to. I try to stay away from YouTube. Uh, I try to stay away from uh, uh, people who cast judgment early before, before we can actually get there. There's the uh, G4 rejected takeoff uh, that happened in uh, Bedford, Massachusetts. Remember that? The flight controls were left, <laughs> lock was left in. And they got to the point where they couldn't rotate the aircraft. And all it took, was, and, and I think there was another recent accident of a very well-known, experienced pilot who was in a hurry and, and went off without checking the flight controls. I, I can't think of a flight, and maybe I've done one, but I can't think of one where I've ever taken off without moving the flight controls through their full range of motion. And, and if you get nothing else out of today, please do that before every takeoff. It's so easy, and it costs nothing. And unless you can tell me a reason not to, you know, I, I can't think of why anybody wouldn't do that. An example of an air safety network for that accident is right here if you care to look at it. But in that docket for the NTSB, you can also see a video, not analyzing the accident, but looking at the video and how they actually train you or tell you what's in the video before you watch it. I'm just going to give you an example of that. The animation does not depict the night lighting conditions that existed at the time of the accident. Certain system parameters or settings are shown, but these displays are not intended to mimic the actual displays in the cockpit. Selected comments from the CVR transcript attributed to the pilot in command, PIC, and second in command, SIC, appear as text at the time indicated in the transcript on the left side of the display area. Based on a review of previous takeoff attempts, the flight crew likely targeted an engine pressure ratio setting, or EPR, of 1.7, which is shown with a green horizontal bar. In addition, there are indications for activation of the auto throttle, flight power shutoff valve handle, or FPSOV, brakes, and thrust reversers. The animation is first shown at one-third speed and then plays again at actual speed. The animation begins as the airplane turns from the taxiway onto the runway. So it explains what you're looking at and all that. I just want to give you an example of the video. Then it goes through the whole thing and you look at this yourself and you're going to see red flag number one, red flag number two, red flag number three. All these things were ignored, all in the interest of the external pressure that we've got to get this thing going because the passenger wants to get there. And he wants to get there now and I want to show him that I'm hurrying for him, which should never rush. There was a serious fuel exhaustion accident that happened uh, out of uh, Addison on its way down to Houston. Got south of the, the DFW Metroplex around uh, somewhere around here. Lost an engine. Tried to return. Uh, sorry, I didn't lose an engine. Realized that they were critically low on fuel. The low fuel light came on and turned around and tried to go back to Addison. It's instinct to go back from the place we came. <laughs> passed over all these airports that were nearby and crashed, killed everybody on board just shy of Addison. If you look at the accident closely, <clears throat> you'll get into the, the NTSB docket and you'll see that there were some receipts in there for fuel and you can see how much fuel was put on, how much wasn't put on. You can see the fuel order that was given and then never filled. He ordered a top off the night before, got out to the airplane, it wasn't topped off, but he assumed it was. I mean, again, always look in your fuel tanks. 
Again, on this one, there's a, a great report on Catherine's report. Another one at Piper Malibu over Ontario, California is a great one I like to study because it basically lost a turbocharger about 16,000 feet overhead Ontario out in Southern California. Continued on, decided to come back to Ontario when it had, it had just passed Ontario, but anyway, coming back to Ontario for the precautionary landing after the partial power loss as a result of losing the turbocharger, the aircraft overflew Ontario, entered a downwind, a long downwind, extended the downwind, got too far out, the engine actually failed didn't make it back to the airport. So 16, from 16,000 feet over an airport, didn't make it in. Spiral, yeah, don't, don't get far from the airport. But you look at this accident docket and you can see a lot about that as well. Um, not sure what this is. I had a bunch of them in here. Oh, there's Ontario, that was the route, that, you know, anyway. So the takeaways from looking at accidents, having looked at hundreds of accidents, um, I have the top three common denominators here, but there, there's actually only two in here. <laughs> so uh, the three was a typo. I could go up to ten, I could go more. The top two, that if you could eliminate what I, these two things, these two things that are common denominators in these accidents, I think you will decrease your odds of getting into an accident by about 90-something percent if not eliminate altogether. But the first one is rushing to comply. If I can, and I just have to implore with you that slow down. There's never a reason to rush. Never a reason to comply. To rush to comply with ATC needs you to do something without delay. Unable. Can't rush. Sorry, I don't, I don't rush. Just wait. Clear for immediate takeoff. Should, unable. Should be the first thing out of your mouth. <laughs> You're going to miss something. There are two speeds. Slow and screw up. And, and a friend of mine said this one, he said, which I like. Smooth. Slow is smooth and smooth is fast, <laughs> which I like. So rushing to comply, we make mistakes. So we have two speeds, slow and screw up. Choose the first one. The other one is going outside the envelope. And by the envelope, I mean all of the things that, uh, that confine us, the rules under which we fly. So there's the two speeds. But inside the envelope, I have a slide I show in a lot of other things. The FARs, the AIM, aircraft flight manual, advisory circulars, insurance limitations. If you rent aircraft, there might be a rental agreement, like don't land on anything other than a hard surface runway. Almost every accident that I've looked at and then analyzed, they got outside here somewhere. They knew the rules but decided to, to go beyond the border. And you don't have to use those limits. You can use your own limits and bring them in a little bit tighter so that there's a margin. And we call that a safety margin. So again, you study these accidents. Watch for those two things if you study accidents, that people were rushing, pilots were rushing in a hurry or I think they call it pink, procedural intentional non-compliance that going outside the envelope. Those are the two things that the big takeaways from all these accidents that I watch uh, that I've studied and I've studied a lot of them and it's a very big common denominator. Uh, I, I'm happy to talk about it, take any questions or go back to any other slides that you might want to see. Any questions? Yeah. Can you go back to that slide? It was like the the oh yeah, the, yeah, the, the envelope. <laughs> Sure. It's a somber topic, but I think it's one that we should all do, studying accidents to learn from the mistakes of others so that they didn't die in vain. You know, we have an accident at the airline, procedures are changed, that accident lives on, and in, in, in the safety gets better, but when, in general aviation, when an accident happens, we don't learn from it unless we study it as individuals. All right, and don't forget, this is uh, good for Wings Credit. Sir, you had a question? <laughs> he says he didn't have time to make all the mistakes himself, so it's nice to learn from the mistakes of others. And it is. It's sad that they made them, but we can learn from them. Yeah. <laughs>